Well, if you'd like to turn to our reading this morning, we're back in Matthew chapter 5. So we're going to return to our studies in the Beatitudes. So if you've got a Bible, it's Matthew and chapter 5 and the first 12 verses. Matthew chapter 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, back into Matthew chapter 5 then, and look at the sixth beatitude this morning. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we're carrying on with this series on the beatitudes, the beautiful attitudes that were taught by the Saviour on the Sermon on the Mount. Divine paradoxes, teachings that perhaps at times go against the attitude of the world, but they're beautiful godly wisdom and guidance as to how to live and truly find blessing from God. Now last time we looked at the attitude, it was in verse 7, one of the outward ways in which we can demonstrate that we are living God's way. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. But this morning in verse 8, we're looking inwards. Look at our hearts, and we find what could be a very difficult one. One which perhaps the whole world would see as good, although their understanding of it may vary. But to achieve this in practice, we'll see, is impossible based on our own efforts. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we look at this verse under three E's this morning. Three X's, actually, three E's. And the first one is this. We find, firstly, there's the exhortation. The exhortation to be pure in heart. If you want to see God, you need to be pure in heart. Now this doesn't sound controversial, paradoxical, contradictory. It sounds very straightforward, doesn't it? But what does the Lord mean? Well, first of all, let's think about purity itself. What does the word purity mean? Well, very simply, the dictionary defines purity as freedom from contamination. And biblical purity is freedom from the contamination of sin. But there's a problem, straight away. We're all contaminated. Now at the moment we're wearing our masks when we go out and about, we sanitise our hands, we wash our hands thoroughly, we keep our distance from each other to try and avoid being contaminated with the germs from this terrible virus. That's good, we're taking the precautions. But we can't do that with sin, because we're all of us contaminated already. Romans 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the problem with sin, as with any contaminants, is that you just need one little bit of bad and it'll spoil the goods. If you've got a bottle of fine wine and you put a tiny drop of poison in that bottle, that's it. The whole bottle is ruined. It spoils. If you have a bottle of poison and put one drop of fine wine in there, what have you got? You've still got a bottle of poison. It's still ruined. It doesn't make the poison less poisonous. The bad will have a big bearing, a big effect on the good and spoil it. And sin is like that poison. One little drop of sin and our lives are polluted. Now, not everybody likes that idea because there are many people in this world who are good. They do good things, they're kind, they're caring, they're considerate. And actually outwardly, if you try to pick out their faults when you look at them, you might struggle. 
If they're honest about themselves, then yes, they might admit that they're not perfect people. They do have an awareness of their own faults and their shortcomings, but to everyone else, they come across as good. But then, of course, you get those who won't even admit their own faults. Those who, it seems, never make a mistake, and boy, are they proud of it. Well, of course, among the Lord's listeners were the Pharisees, the religious experts, the teachers of the law. And they were the ones who everyone looked up to. And that's just how they liked to come across. They knew the Old Testament laws, and they added their own bits to it, and their own regulations, and they wanted people to look at them and see them as being the holiest of all. They were the ones who never made a mistake. On the outside, yes, to many people, they may have come across as the super pure men. And yet, in Matthew 23, we find the Lord Jesus had these stinging indictments against these men. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. See, one commentator puts it this way. The religious leaders had an artificial external righteousness based on the law. But the righteousness Jesus described is a true and vital righteousness that begins internally in the heart. The Pharisees were concerned about the minute details of conduct, but they neglected the major matter of character. See, outwardly, they were the experts at looking holy. But inwardly, it was a very different story. They acted righteously, they were full of self-righteousness, but they were just as guilty of sin as everybody else. Bad thoughts, bad attitudes, we all have them, all of us. And 1 John 1 warns us that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now these men were not without sin, and their hearts were not right before God. And the heart is where the purity must start, where it must radiate from. That's why the Lord said, blessed are the pure in heart. Not our physical hearts, not the thing inside us that keeps the blood pumping around our body, but our character. Outwardly, we can be the best, most law-abiding citizen in the world, but if our heart is wrong, it's worth nothing. And actually, if your heart is wrong, if you're not right on the inside, then the way you live on the outside will not be perfect either. See, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jeremiah 17 warns us, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct according to what their deeds deserve. God searches the heart. He searches our hearts. And he's looking for pure hearts, clean hearts, hearts untarnished by sin. God is perfectly holy, and only those who are pure may see him. Or as Psalm 24 puts it, which is what the Lord is echoing here in this beatitude, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The answer, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. So here we've got our problem, haven't we? If we want to see God, if we want to stand in his presence, we must have a pure heart. But each of us has been polluted already, contaminated by sin. None of this is perfect. In the words of Proverbs 20, who can say, I've kept my heart pure, I'm clean and without sin? None of us. None of us can claim that. So the exhortation is to be pure in heart, and yet this seems to be an unreachable standard. But as we know, with man this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So how can we experience having a pure heart? Experience. See, having the desire to see God is the first step on the pathway towards purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you want to see God? Yes, that means that we've got a desire for him. If we want to see him, we will seek his face. To seek his face means our desire is for him. And being pure in heart means that we're striving to keep our mind and motives pure by thinking on the things of the Lord. Being pure of heart is a, an attitude, not just a set of actions. But our actions will eventually follow as conduct flows from character. Once we have our priorities sorted, once we have this desire for God, then our hearts can be changed. You see, the psalmist cried out to God, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
And when we reach that point of desiring God and acknowledging that we are sinners, realising that we are lost, realising that our hearts are contaminated and that we have no hope without God, we can echo that cry to create in us a pure heart. And we realise that he is our only hope. He can purify our hearts again. And he does this by forgiving all our sin because the only truly pure-hearted person who ever lived, the only one who lived surrounded by sinners and yet was not contaminated, was the Lord Jesus. And he took on his shoulders the, all the guilt of the world, the guilt of the sin of the world. And he paid the penalty for it by dying on the cross. When we turn to him in repentance, the slate is wiped clean. Our sins are forgiven. We can't purify ourselves, but Jesus creates in us that new pure heart that we need, gives us that new start, and from this should flow a new way of living that's more in step with God's ways, both inwardly and outwardly. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I've used the illustration a few times over the years for that children's talk where I get the overhead projector, the old overhead projector, and the, um, the template of a heart, and some Smarties. And remind us that Smarties are a bit like sin, because they're colourful and attractive on the outside, but they're dark on the inside. And when you have one, you can't help but have another, and then another. One leads on to another one, just like sin. And then I illustrate by having the, the shape of this lovely, clean, white heart being projected on the wall, and I gradually put Smarties on the heart shape and so more of it gets obscured by the darkness of the shadow on there and it shows how sin makes our hearts dirty but then how asking Jesus to forgive us can wipe us clean and then I'll move the smarties off the heart shape we get a fresh start we get a clean heart the blood of Jesus washes us clean from our sins but of course this isn't a once for all fix because try as we might we're still not perfect and we still sin. Our hearts do not stay pure for very long. Well, let's just consider for, another, for a few moments another word, sanctification. What does that mean? 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 begins by saying, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. And sanctified means that we're set apart or declared holy, or purified. And it's not an optional extra of the Christian life, it's an essential and ongoing work. There are many Christians today who live far from holy lives. And if we're honest, and we look closely at our own lives, there'll be times where we'll say, yes, well, at times that's true for me as well. Times when we fall far short of the mark. Sanctified doesn't mean sanctimonious, doesn't mean holier than thou, doesn't mean that we're being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly goods. But it does mean that we are to remember that we are set apart. We are God's. We're not our own. We've been bought at a price, bought with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we should be living for him and striving to live in a way that pleases him. Striving to live good, clean lives. And as believers, we've been chosen by God despite our sins, despite our weaknesses. And he has sanctified us, made us pure. How has he done that? Well, first of all, at the point of salvation, when the Holy Spirit draws us to God, helps us to realise that need of a saviour and gives us the faith to take that first step into new life as Christians. Our sin, our shame, the filth of our lives can be forgiven and we're washed clean through the blood of Jesus. And then we belong to God. One Tim, uh, 2 Timothy 2 says we are set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. But the sanctifying work doesn't stop there because we're still not perfect. Becoming a Christian isn't just a quick fix and suddenly all the badness goes away. No, there's still rough edges. There are still habits that need to be broken. Still things that need to change. And this process of purification, sanctification, is ongoing. At times it can be painful as we struggle to let go of our own ways. And there will still be times where we will let God down again and again. We won't be perfectly pure or sinless until we get up to heaven. But actually, it's been said that the closer our walk with God and the deeper our faith, the more aware we'll be of our own unholiness and shortcomings compared to the perfect holiness of God. And that will make us want to get things right, want to try harder. 
We realise how unworthy we are, but God in his grace loves us and takes us as we are and helps us to change. We shouldn't write ourselves off when we fail, because we'll all fail, we'll all make mistakes, we'll all get it wrong. And the enemy would try and convince us that when we do that, we're no good, but we shouldn't listen. We should keep going on with the Lord. Keep looking to him to help us to change, because the Holy Spirit is at work within us. But we also need to do our bit too. Keeping away from the things that would tempt us, throw off the sin that so easily entangles. As we let God in our lives, we won't always uh, let God work in our lives. We won't always get A for achievements. There will be times when we'll slip up, but we should be striving for A for efforts, doing our best to walk in the way that gives glory to Him. So, in sanctification, in purification, we see all three tenses. We see past where we were first saved. We see present as the Holy Spirit continues to work in our lives. But best of all, we can look to the future when we get up to heaven. And we'll be perfectly pure in heaven. No more sin up there. We will be perfect. So Paul says in that verse then that it's God's will that we should be sanctified, be holy, be pure. How can we do this? Well, Psalm 119 verse 9 asks the question, how can a young man keep his way pure? Young man, a young woman, an older man, an older woman, how can anybody keep their way pure? The answer by living according to your words. Spend time with the Lord every day. Read his word, feed on the word of God. Pray, ask him to help. Let his Holy Spirit work in our lives. And our experience will be that we'll be seeking his face more, desiring to please him more, and experiencing the blessing that he has for us. What an experience. So blessed are the pure in heart. What can we expect then? If our hearts are purified, what's our expectation? We shall see God. Now for us as believers, this means that we have the hope of the joy of heaven. The only way to heaven is through faith in the Lord Jesus and having trusted him for the forgiveness of our sins. We'll be in his presence for all eternity and that's a wonderful thing to look forward to. But what about the here and now? What things can we expect in this life? by way of seeing God. Well, John Piper, the American preacher and writer, suggests three things. Firstly, we can expect to be admitted to his presence. In Exodus 33, verse 20, God told Moses that no one could see his face and live. And in the Old Testament days, there were strict rules as to who could even go into the presence of God in the tabernacle. Yes, God is omnipresent. He is all around. He spreads the heavens out like a tent, as I said earlier. He can be anywhere, everywhere at once. So in a sense, we are always in his presence. But who could draw near to him? Back then, in the Old Testament days, Moses had special rights of access. So too did the priests who would go in to make intercession for the people and offer sacrifices for their sins. But now, the way to stand before God in his presence is open to all. Hebrews 10 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. How have we had our hearts sprinkled and cleansed? It's a few verses earlier in that chapter where it says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now to have a right of audience with any king or queen or world leader is quite something. It must be an amazing thing to be invited to stand in the presence of the queen. And I know a few people who have, who have had that privilege. Yet through the work of the Lord Jesus, we have an even greater privilege to stand in the presence and to have the right of audience with the King of Kings. Wonderful. Psalm 27 says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That should be our desire as well. So to be admitted to his presence. Secondly, to be awestruck by his glory. Awestruck by his glory. Seeing God means we can be awestruck by his glory. 
John Piper says this, virtually all of our spiritual sight in this life is mediated to us through the word of God or the work of God in providence. We see images and reflections of his glory. We hear echoes and reverberations of his voice. It's true. We can look around us at the wonders of creation, from the smallest creature to the most faraway star, and it brings home to us just what an amazing God we have. We can look at the provision that he so graciously gives us. Harvest is fast approaching, when we'll perhaps reflect on this even more, although of course we should be thankful for God's provision at all times. But it can be so easy for us to take these things for granted. And for those who don't have any faith, well, these things are just there. They, or they have their own beliefs as to how they came to, to be there. But as believers, we can marvel at the glory of God. We have these little tasters now, but of course there will come a day when God himself will dwell among us. His glory will no longer be inferred from lightning and mountains and roaring seas and constellations of stars. Instead, we'll have a direct experience of him. His glory will be the very light in which we move, and the beauty of his holiness will be tasted directly like honey on the tongue. So seeing God means not only being admitted to his presence, but also being awestruck by an experience of his glory. And it also means that we will be comforted by his grace. Seeing God means being comforted by his grace. In Psalm 27, David says this, Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Saviour. Now, do not hide your face from me is much the same as saying, be gracious to me. And this means that seeing the face of God is considered to be a sweet and comforting experience. I remember as a child when I'd had a nightmare, I'd wake up, I'd be crying, and mum would come in to see how I was. And seeing her face was an immediate comfort. It's what I needed to make me feel better. All children say the same thing when they've had a nasty experience and the smiling face of a parent is there, caring for them. We may not be able to see the face of our Heavenly Father, but we can have an awareness of his grace, expressed in all that he does for us. Most of all in the fact that we've been saved from our sins and from the punishment that we deserve. And that grace should be a source of comfort to us. God is always on hand, whatever we go through in life, to be our comforter. So we have these three aspects of seeing God. In part now, yes, but then in the age to come, when we're up in heaven, we'll experience them fully, if we are pure in heart. So how then can we be pure in heart? Simply this, turn to God, ask him to cleanse you. God is the one who purifies our hearts, and the instrument with which he cleans it is faith. So therefore we should all trust in the Lord with all our hearts. Look to him, live his way, ask him to make our hearts pure, to create in us a pure heart, and then we shall see God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that purity is a, a very tall order. We live in a world which is spoiled by sin. Sin is all around us and sin is in us too, Lord. We acknowledge that we are imperfect people. But we thank you that through faith in you, we can be given a fresh start. When we first come to you, Lord, and confess our sins to you and repent, our sins are washed away. We are given that, uh, that new birth. And we thank you, Lord, that we are forgiven. But we know that we're still imperfect people. We still have sin going on um, in our lives and there are times when we let you down. Father, I pray that we would be people who long to do things your way, who long to be living more in accordance with your word and your ways. People whose desire is to have pure hearts, hearts that are fully devoted to you. Father, help us in this, I pray. Help us as we go into another week to be looking to you to continue to work in our lives, to help us to be the people that we should be, to equip us for whatever comes along. And Lord, help us to hold on to that promise that we'll be blessed if we do this and that we have the assurance that we will see you. Thank you, Lord, for your words. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.